I love leading people in the wilderness. The wilderness is the place where God forms his people. And even God speaks positively about the wilderness. God longs for the wilderness when Israel followed him like a bride. It's in the wilderness that Israel only has eyes for God. Now, God only has eyes for Israel, but it's in the wilderness that, that Israel only has eyes for God. But listen, the word wilderness has a root word, and the root word of wilderness is wild. The wilderness is a wild place. And C.S. Lewis, at the end of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when that great character Aslan struts, struts by, one says, oh, Aslan is so good. And another character says, good, but not tame. And Aslan, of course, is a picture of Jesus, a picture of God, who's good, but not tame. Tame, if I had to define the word tame, predictable. Now here's something. I look at this and I see wilderness. Any eye can see that. Any eye can see that this is a wild place. But not every eye can see that as wilderness. That is a wild place. You look at this and it's abundantly clear that it's a wild place. It's a place with hot sun, rock, sand, heat, lack of water. I mean, it's obviously that you gotta calibrate to this place right from the moment you step into it. Over there, let me tell you what Egypt was. What Egypt was for God's people under the leadership of Joseph, Egypt was the place where God saved his people from famine. Egypt is the place where Joseph went into and he went into as a slave. He was sold to Potiphar. He was betrayed. He was imprisoned. And in spite of all of that, the gifts that God had given him, Joseph was able to interpret dreams and he would end up interpreting the dream of none other than Pharaoh himself. And in those interpretations, Joseph managed Egypt in such a way that not only was Joseph's life spared, not only was Pharaoh's life spared, not only was Egypt's life spared, but Egypt prospered. And because of the prospering of Egypt, Joseph was rewarded because he had blessed, God had blessed Pharaoh through Joseph. Now Pharaoh wanted to bless Joseph. So Joseph's entire family comes into Egypt and Joseph is second only to Pharaoh. It's as if you want to see Pharaoh, look at Joseph. And so Joseph is a ruler and God's people come into Egypt as rulers. And they are given the most favorable, the most fertile piece of land, the land of Goshen. But you've got to understand that Egypt's a wild place. If you don't manage Egypt, Egypt's going to manage you. Egypt is far, looks far different to the eye than this, the wilderness. Here, you know what you got. Over there, you don't necessarily know what you've got. And because they didn't master Egypt, Egypt mastered them. And it's as if God pulled the curtain back and the real character of Egypt came forth. And Egypt, with all of its fertility, with all of its wealth, with all of its influence, and God's people at the top of the heap got intoxicated with it, got dependent upon it. And then as everything got nickled and dimed away, and as the Pharaoh came in who didn't know Joseph, then the Hebrews, rather than being masters, became slaves. But they didn't leave Egypt yet. Then their sons were thrown into the Nile and they still didn't leave Egypt. 
they were oppressed and treated ruthlessly, they still didn't leave Egypt. It's kind of like the frog in the water being brought to a boil. And the frog stays in there because he doesn't understand that it's a wild place. You look at the wilderness, anybody can tell you, that's a wild place. That's why we call it wilderness, wilderness. God looks at Egypt. It's a wild place. Now, they've lived in Egypt for over 400 years. They're being oppressed. They're enslaved, they're oppressed. Their future is being trying to be robbed from them by the killing of their baby boys. And God looks at them and says, it's time, enough. The people are crying out. The Hebrew word for cry out is sa'aka. It is a heart-wrenching cry. And what's interesting to me that the children of Israel in Egypt cried out to God and not one of the hundreds of Egyptian deities heard their cry. But God says to Moses on Sinai, I have heard their cry. And Moses, I want to send you to them with a message. I want you to tell them that I've heard their cry. I want you to tell them that I'm going to deliver them. And I'm going to give you a couple of signs to show the elders, your staff, your hand in your cloak. And so Moses leaves Sinai and goes to Egypt, back to Egypt for him. Now the biblical narrative doesn't tell us what that discussion with the elders looks like. What we do have in the biblical narrative is the discussion between Pharaoh and Moses. But we don't have the discussion between the elders and Moses, and you'll have to give me a little latitude because this is the way I think it happened. Moses comes to the elders, and they have been ah, crying out to God. They've been crying out to any God that would hear them. Help! And Moses comes to them and says, listen, God has heard your cry. He has? Yes. I've got great news. You do? Yes. He's going to deliver you. He is? How? He's going to bring you out of from out of there into there. He's going to bring you from there over to there. Now, if I was one of the elders, you know what I'd say? How about a new pharaoh? <laughs> Could we have a new pharaoh? I mean, you want to bring us out of this fertility into this wild place? But you see, we serve a God who's good, but he's not tame. And in the eyes of God, what looks like death, look at it. What looks like death is life. And what looks as life is death. Now, from an Egyptian context, that's the land of Osiris. That's the land of fertility. That's Kemet. That's the black land. This is the land of Set, that wild god, that god that tries to kill the black land. What's interesting to me is that Moses comes with a message of deliverance from the land of Set to people who are in the land of Kemet, Osiris, and he comes with a message of deliverance. Where you would think the message of deliverance would come from the land of Osiris to the land of Set. So Moses comes to his people out of this into there with a message of deliverance. And I'm telling you, 
even to believe what Moses was saying is a huge act of faith because that's a paradigm shifter. That's a wild thing. That's a wild thing. But I got to tell you, you serve a good God, but he's not tame. A God who is sovereign over all. A God who comes to a young girl and says, you are most favored of women. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to have a child. And that child's going to be the redeemer of God's people. Now, as it turns out, this young girl was betrothed to be married, which means, though, she's not married yet. Now, the Holy Spirit could have waited until that final vow was made, but he didn't. And she became pregnant under the sovereignty and the will of God so that her child and her culture would be viewed as illegitimate. In Hebrew, a mumser. And God comes into this world in the opposite way that you think would be helpful for him, because he's a good God, but he's not tame.